what makes me good at my job is also what makes me bad at life. I, I don't feel I'm a, a, an especially attentive or present friend. Is it something that comes with a cost and is it something you want to change? Look, I think in general, <laughs> what, you know, I've said this and probably someone else said it as well, uh, that, you, you know, what you think may be your disability is also your superpower. Mm, exactly. And I think, um, uh, I think that I, in, uh, I think I've struggled with intimacy sometimes my, you know, and, and I think I, 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 you know, in terms of relationship building in, in my private life, like it's, it's a running joke between me and my wife, like that she's extremely sort of emotionally acute and that I'm kind of slightly the opposite, which is kind of weird when you think about my job, which hinges on uh, supposedly being sort of maybe emotionally or psychologically perceptive, but it's almost as though, but I see it in my mum as well. Like my mum, having worked at the BBC, went into um, therapy and became a relationship counsellor. And it's funny because um, my mum also finds it difficult sometimes to to fully inhabit her her emotions. If it doesn't sound an odd thing to say, I, I, and, and I don't, I'm going to probably regret saying that, but let's make it about me. And I think w with me, I think, um, yeah, I don't always find r intimacy easy. Like it's, it, it, it's so 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 I sort of I, I experience like a lot of the times my work is is a license to be intimate without consequences. Like to get to, to, to a bit like what you're doing now. Like you talk to people, someone in a prison, you know, who's been sentenced to ten life sentences. He's like, okay, how does that feel? So what is what's life like? And and then. <clears throat> kind of get, getting, or whatever happens to me, all the work I've done in some sense is about attempting to peel layers back and 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 see inside someone's psyche and then get on a plane and fly off and go home and live my normal life almost at a, a less intimate plane of existence. And um, so clearly, you know, and the other joke I've made over the years is like, oh, what makes me good at my job is also what makes me bad at life. <laughs> so, So for me, it's, I think, and I think you, if you ask my friends, they might say, you know, be like, oh yeah, you know, Louis is a good guy. I hope they would say that. But but they'd also might say like, he's a little bit absent. Like he's a little bit, um, I, I don't feel I'm a, a, an especially attentive or present friend. And, 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 you know, I'm not, you know, some people are really gifted at friendship. Like oh, they, God. they like really, get, they're there and they think about and they make arrangements and, I don't make really, I'm, I'm not very good at social arrangements, all these sort of boring things that are the qualities that are really the stuff of life, like um, just getting together, reaching out. Are you okay? How's it? It's been a while since I saw you. I wanted to, let's meet up. Let's, which in general, this is a crass generalization, but I think women are slightly better at than men. And I think that's been one of the many gifts my wife has given me is actually involving me in life, like in a, just a normal sort of neurotypical way. Whereas I, my tendency would be to sort of disappear into my slightly incel like shell, you know, of, of kind of in a metaphorical shed of kind of counting. I, the joke in my, making my book is like, you know, separating my collection of screws and nails into their different jars. You know what I mean? Like that for me is like that, you know, a lot of guys would be like, yeah, that sounds like heaven to have two hours to organize my shed, you know, and not, and not realize that you're missing out on the tapestry of life. So I plead guilty to whatever that is. <laughs> Maybe that's just being a man. I can, I can relate to, <laughs> it's funny, I was having this conversation yesterday with my friends where they were all saying, yeah, Steve doesn't like to socialize. You know, I, I would rather sit upstairs for seven days on my own working than like, it was someone said to me, they said, you meet all these wonderful people on this mm -hmm. podcast and you, and it's such a wasted opportunity that you don't text me, hey, let's go for a coffee. Yeah. And it's just outside of my nature. My nature is to sit alone on my laptop and work. Yeah. And so again, my girlfriend, my yeah. partner is the opposite. Yeah. So she's dragging me in. So I, I think it's quite that. a common dynamic. You know, not bragging, two nights ago, I was a GQ man of the year. I see. Thank you. Applause. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I was one of the honorees. And um, so there was a like there was a, a banquet like a a, a, di a posh dinner catered by 
Heston Blumenthal. And, you know, Stormzy was going to be there, Mo Salah, Leah Williamson, the footballer. I didn't get an invite. I must have so got it's not just post. men now, it turns out. <laughs> uh, extraordinary list of, like, Andrew Garfield, an extraordinary list of incredible people. And it wasn't even an awards bank. It wasn't even like the BAFTAs, like where you sit and sit through the speeches and then at half past 10 when you're starving, hungry and quite tired, you sit down and eat your food. This was like a banquet banquet where you just sit around and have a delicious meal and then a few people pop up and say a few words between starter and the main course. So it was like, and it wasn't even that, it was like maybe a couple hundred people, like quite small as these things go. But the point is, is before on the evening of, I was like, I don't want to go. And I said, to, I knew I had to go. But I said to Nancy, my wife, I was like, I am not feeling this. She's like, what is it? I said, I just, I can't, I, you know, I don't know. I just feel really anxious. And she's like, but you're not even giving a speech, are you? Because you know, sometimes it's that, like, what if we win and I have to give a speech? Or or you're worrying about whether you're going to win. It's like, I knew I was an honoree and I knew I wasn't going to say any, I wasn't going to have to give a speech. And it was just the idea of, of having to talk to people like oh and in a relatively high water high wattage setting so you think like i don't want to be wandering around like a blithering idiot so there's a sort of little stress that sits alongside that but there was no real reason on paper why i shouldn't have been thinking well this is going to be amazing this is going to be a night i remember my whole life you know and i attempted to adjust my mindset you know using kind of <laughs> paul mckenna like or yuri geller like you know, just visualize, think about what this is. This is going to be, no one's expecting anything of you. This is a chance to sit down with some, some amazing people and have fun. But nevertheless, for the first kind of hour, I was there just thinking, I kept just sighing. <sighs> and Nancy was like, what's the matter? So I think that's just, for whatever, I think that's in me. It's probably in a lot of, a lot of people and um, you just deal with it. But that, you know, why Why should that be the case? I don't, I don't really know why. Is it something that comes with a cost and is it something you want to change? Uh, if you're being really honest. If I yourself. could dial down, I think sometimes, I think I have changed it actually is the first thing to say. Because there were times in my life where I said no to things just because I thought that's going to be a bit like, the, you know, I did the maypole dancing in the end and it went fine. I did learn, this will surprise you, but I did learn how to read. And, you know, despite all the anxiety I had about doing that. And so, and then as life went on, I think there were times when I said no to things, opportunities, which probably just because the idea, I, I was asked to go on David Letterman's chat show um, when it was on CBS. This would have been in around 2001. And I said no, because I thought that's just going to make me anxious. And looking back on it, I probably wish I'd done that. It's why, not would huge... that why would that make you anxious? I find the chat show experience uh, uh, not especially, I mean, I've done it a few times and, and it, as life goes on, it seems, you know, the idea of public speaking or, you know, when I first got into TV, it, it, it was like, why am I doing this? This is not me. Like, this is not what I was cut out for. This is not something that I aspire to do. And it sounds really, it, you know, the whole notion of it, feels um, intimidating and, and, and just a bad fit. And, and nevertheless, I knew that, you know, you know, just briefly, like I was working in magazines as a, um, as a journalist in New York. And um, that's, I, I, I aspired to be a, a TV writer, partly as a way of sort of avoiding comparison with my dad, not directly, but I suppose that was in my mind was like, I want to write and be creative, but I know I'll never write books. You know, I didn't feel like I wrote, when I wrote, it didn't feel especially as though it came as easily as I sh as it should. You know, it's hard when your dad, like I relate to people with famous parents, like, you know, people like, you know, Jacob Dylan, yeah. who's Bob Dylan's son. I don't know why I reach for that comparison, <laughs> but Jacob Dylan, that track, One Headlight, do you remember that one? No. Okay, for people who know, they know. <laughs> You know, it's a great track. It was a huge international hit, but his dad's Bob Dylan. That's a painful, maybe not painful, but that's an extraordinary legacy to be born into. And in a, in a related way, like I was conscious of my dad, his name as a writer really meant something. And that it was, um, that if I was to attempt to 
write something, it was going to be a case of very likely kind of falling short, at least in my own mind. But the idea of writing in television w was was less, I felt, would set, w would, wouldn't invite the same comparisons. Plus, I used to watch TV and I liked TV and there was something about the democratic kind of nature of television, the fact that everyone watches TV. I thought, well, that's a way of working in a medium that will connect with people. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favour, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests. Uh -huh.